Hello and good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brett Paul, and you're watching News at 10. Our headlines tonight. First dose PIC kits only until 15 May. Clark gets six years jail and fine over death of eight cyclists. First dose of COVID-19 vaccine under the National COVID-19 Immunization Program for Children, PIC Kids, will be dispensed until 15 May. With that, starting 16 May, the Health Ministry will no longer offer the first dose of the Community and CoronaVac vaccine to children aged between 5 to 12 years old. In a statement today, Deputy Health Minister Dr. Dr. Noor Azmi Ghazali said the decision was made by COVID-19 Immunization Task Force Children, CITFC, to avoid vaccine wastage. This comes as the demand for vaccination among children has lately been declining and the community vaccine must be administered within six months after its manufacturing date. As such, community vaccine will no longer be offered at any public or private health facilities, while coronavac vaccine will remain available at private facilities, but the vaccination costs will no longer be borne by the government. However, for children born in 2017 or have yet to reach the age of 5 on 15 May this year, they will still be eligible to register for vaccination in the My Sajatra application. In the meantime, parents still have until the 8th of May to register their children for inoculation. Or for those already registered but yet to be jabbed, they will be contacted and given a new appointment date. As of yesterday, a total of 1.37 million, or about 38.6% of children population, have been jabbed with the first dose under PIC Kids since launch on 3rd February this year. The National Pharmaceutical Regulatory Agency, NPRA, has received 26,071 adverse events following immunization, AFI, reports from the National COVID-19 Immunization Program, including 1,552 reports from booster vaccine recipients and 288 from child vaccine recipients. About 93% of the total reports of vaccine side effects received as of 8 April are not serious, while 1,831 AFI reports are serious, equivalent to 27 reports per million doses. The serious AFI reports included 610 fatalities, out of which 460 were concluded by the Special COVID-19 Vaccine Pharmacovigilance Committee to be unrelated to the vaccine. The remaining 150 death cases are still under investigation. There were 137 serious AFI cases among COVID-19 booster vaccine recipients, which included 57 deaths, 25 of which have been concluded by regulators to be unconnected connected to the vaccine. The remaining 32 death reports are still under investigation. 18 of the 288 AFI reports for the coronavirus inoculation program for children are serious and the sole fatality of the child who received a vaccine dose was reported as a brought in dead case that is still under investigation. The Johor Bahru High Court today sentenced a female cluck to six years jail and 6,000 ringgit fine after finding her guilty of reckless driving, which caused the death of eight teenage cyclists five years ago. Judge Dato Abu Bakar Qatar ordered Sam Kating, 27, to serve the jail sentence from today. She was also disqualified from driving for three years and must serve another six months in jail if she failed to pay the fine. Today's decision set aside the magistrate's court's decision on 10 October last year to acquit and discharge the woman of the charge. Judge Abu Bakar said the trial court had erred when it failed to decide whether the woman's defence in her unsworn statement was a mere denial or an afterthought. 
He also said the trial court had erred when it failed to consider that the women's defense had not raised any reasonable doubt over the prosecution's case for the charge of reckless driving given the winding and slightly hilly road conditions. Earlier, the prosecution, represented by Johor Prosecution Director Tengku Amizaki, Tengku Abdul Rahman, and Deputy Public Prosecutor Muhammad Shafiq Muhammad Ghazali, pressed for an appropriate punishment for the women by taking into consideration the principle of public interest. However, the women, represented by lawyer Muhammad Faisal Mukta, requested a lighter penalty as it was her first offence and she still has parents to support and care for. A 41-year-old self-employed man and his teen daughter have been jointly charged with the murder of a five-year-old girl whose skeletal remains were found near a residential area in Suramban on 7 April. No plea was recorded from the accused, Khalid Reza Shuib, and his 17-year-old daughter after they were charged before Magistrate Mohammad Firdaus Saleh. The accused were jointly charged with murdering the victim, Hanan Hazrul Iswan, at a house in Taman Niyan at around 7 p.m. on 3rd March. At a separate court, the male accused was produced before Magistrate Nur Zaliza Tasnim with the murder of 29 year old Mariama Abdul Basam, whose remains were found in a ravine along Jalan Bukit Putus on 20th March. He allegedly committed the crime between 13 and 15 March at the same house. No plea was recorded from the accused. The father and daughter were charged under Section 302 of the Penal Code, read together with Section 34, which carries the mandatory death penalty upon conviction or a jail term of up to 30 years and whipping. Both magistrates fixed 17 May for next mention. The male accused, however, pleaded guilty before Muhammad Firdaus to a separate charge of voluntarily causing grievous hurt to one city Sharifa Aibidin, 35, at the same house. He was charged with committing the offence under Section 325 of the Penal Code between the 1st of December last year and 23rd March. Former Deputy Prime Minister Datu Sri Dr. Ahmad Zahid Hamidi told the Kuala Lumpur High Court today that he had never instructed anyone to use Yayasan Akalbudi funds for his personal matters. According to Datu Sri Ahmad Zahid, 69, he was the one footing the bill for all of the foundation's expenses since its establishment in 1997. Datu Sri Abad Zayed said that in the early stages of its establishment of the foundation, most of the funds were from his contributions, salary and savings, including profits from the purchase and sale of shares for being active in the corporate world. The accused, who is one of the foundation's trustees since 1997, said this is to ensure that Yayasan Akalbudi can carry out charity programs and provide assistance as well as contributions to individuals or parties in need and also in the construction of mosques, mahat and other institutions. He said this when reading his witness statement on the first day of the defence proceedings on 47 criminal breach of trust, CBT, corruption and money laundering charges involving Yayasan Akalbudi funds. Seven individuals were charged in the Shah Alam Sessions Court today to seven charges of money laundering involving their collection and possession of property resulting from illegal gambling activities. Now, all the accused pleaded not guilty before Judge Helena Sulaiman. According to the charge sheet, businessman Chung Chi Young, 44, and his wife Lim Li Cheng, 40, had used the premise to operate gambling machines. Chung was also charged along with his wife and mother, Tan Kui Eng, 65, and four other men with owning six luxury cars as a result of the illegal gambling operation. The luxury cars are three Bentleys, a BMW X5, Toyota Alpha, and Honda Accord, registered under the names of six individuals, Lim Kui Eng, Ng Min Lin, Tang Ka Hock, Ko Beng Sin, and Lai Yi Ping. All of them were charged under subsection 4, subsection 1, subsection B of the Anti-Money Laundering, Prevention of Financing of Terrorism and Proceeds from Illegal Activities Act 2001, Act 613, with the offence punishable under subsection 4, subsection 1 of the same Act. 
They face up to 15 years imprisonment and a fine no less than five times the amount of proceeds from the illegal activity or five million ringgit, whichever higher upon conviction. Judge Helena allowed all the accused bail of 20,000 ringgit each and to submit their passports to the court while the case will be mentioned on 31st May. The Domestic Trade and Consumer Affairs Ministry, KPDN HEP, has busted a subsidized diesel embezzlement activity at a petrol station in Teluk Kamang, Port Dixon. Deputy Director of Enforcement Operations, Shamsul Nizam Khalil, said the raid was made following intelligence work conducted over the past two weeks. Explaining further, Shamsul Nizam said authorities have opened an investigation paper under the Supply Control Act AKB 1961 in order to identify the diesel distribution chain. Dan kita pun telah mengenal pasti beberapa sedikit yang terlibat di dalam aktiviti ini yang menggunakan pelbagai jenis kenderaan. Lori yang diubah suai, kepala lori dan juga apa nama Kanvas, lori yang ber, berkanvas itu untuk mengaburi uh, pihak berkuasa dan juga mengaburi uh, pihak stesen juga lah. Jadi uh, mana-mana orang yang melakukan kesalahan di bawah atas kawalan atas kawalan kelas nama satu ini boleh jika sebut kesalahan indera tidak melebihi satu juta ringgit bagi individu atau tiga tahun penjara atau tiga kedua-duanya sekali. Mana kena bagi syarikat boleh indera sehingga dua juta ringgit. Met by reporters today, he said a tanker truck was loading 232 litres of diesel fuel worth 500 ringgit into a storage tank at the petrol station when the raid took place and preliminary investigation found that the lorry driver had made payment of 1,000 ringgit for filling the fuel twice. He also said the company involved would be investigated under the Anti-Money Laundering, Anti-Terrorism Financing and Proceeds from Illegal Activities Act 2001 Act 613. Over 3,000 swine from a commercial farm in Pera has been infected with African swine fever or ASF. Pera Exco Rasman Zakaria said the affected animals will be immediately culled under Section 19 of the Animals Act 1953, revised 2006, in order to prevent further spread of the virus. To date, 990 pigs have been culled by the farms involved in the state. The disease was first reported at a commercial pig farm in the Hile Pera district on 27 March and two more in Batang Padang were confirmed to have been infected with the virus following real-time PCR tests by the laboratory of the Ipoh Veterinary Research Institute. Susulan dari penularan penyakit ini, notis kurantin di bawah Seksyen 182 Akta Binatang 1953 semakkan pada 2006 Akta 647 telah dikeluarkan kepada pemilik ladang krizir yang disahkan positif untuk tidak memindahkan ternakan krizir kas-kas Keluar masuk daripada ladang terjangkit. Briefing reporters today, he said another six pig farms located within a five kilometer radius of the infected area had also confirmed cases of ASF and were being quarantined for further inspection and sampling. Rasman took the opportunity to advise commercial swine rearers to increase biosecurity measures in order to prevent future outbreaks. Meanwhile, he assured that the disease is not a zoonotic one and is not a threat to human health, as it cannot be transmitted from pigs to humans. And yet to come, Air Asia Malaysia tracking demand for international flights. Stay with us. But first, Siemens Energy has announced it will set up its Managed Detection Response Operational Technology Cybersecurity Operations Center in Cyberjaya, the first of its kind in the Asia-Pacific region. The center will bring a projected investment inflow of more than 10 million ringgit in the next two to three years, which will commence operations at the end of 2022. 
The center will proactively monitor, detect and prevent real-time cyber attacks and is powered by a state-of-the-art artificial intelligence-based managed detection response technology platform. According to Malaysian Investment Development Authority, Deputy Chief Executive Officer Siva Suryamurti Sundaraja Raja, the initiative is in line with the agency's target of investment digitalization under the My Digital Initiative worth 70 billion ringgit by 2020. Menggalakkan pelaburan-pelaburan dalam uh, digital investment ya, di mana syarikat-syarikat perkilangan khususnya perlu melabur untuk upgrade themselves in the digital space. Ya. Oleh yang demikian, perkhidmatan ditawarkan oleh uh, Siemens uh, Energy ini adalah begitu uh, amat diperlukan, begitu kritikal. Lebih-lebih lagi, uh, dalam arena cyber security. The center is expected to position Malaysia as a rising cyber security hub for the Asia Pacific with the aim of servicing customers globally in the future. The construction of the East Coast Rail Link ECRL project has recorded overall progress of 28.57%. Thus far, Malaysia Rail Link Sindiran Berhad, MRL Chief Executive Officer Datuk Sri Darvis Abdul Raza said the percentage included construction works in four states, namely Kelantan, Trengganu, Pahang and Selangor. Secara keseluruhannya kita tidak menghadapi banyak masalah. Alhamdulillah banyak isu-isu telah diselesaikan dengan kerjasama yang baik daripada semua pihak khususnya daripada kerajaan negeri yang terlibat. Commencing further, he said that the construction work of the 16.39 km Genting Tunnel from Pahang to Slango will begin next month. That was Sri Darvis added that the Genting Tunnel excavation process involving 10 km in Pahang and another 6 km in Slango is expected to take two and a half years with a productivity rate of approximately between 400 to 600 meters per month. The ECRL project, which will create a better sophisticated and modern transportation system in the East Coast states is expected to start operating in January 2027. DG.com Berhad, DG, is confident of delivering a robust performance this year, underpinned by sharp execution of its strategic priorities. Its Chief Executive Officer, Albert Murti, said postpaid, fibre and business are the key growth drivers, and DG will continue to bring best value product propositions and innovative digital solutions to the market. Murti, in DG's Integrated Annual Report 2021, said the company's business modernization journey is progressing well, with critical information technology transformation projects in the pipeline to enhance digital experience for the customers and boost organizational capabilities. He said DG is working closely with the Malaysian Communications and Multimedia Commission, MCMC, including on universal service provision initiatives, which will strengthen its ability to provide high-quality and affordable digital connectivity to communities in rural and remote areas. On another note, Murti said the proposed merger of Cellcom Aksiata Berhad and DG's wholly owned unit DG Telecommunications Sundiran Berhad, announced last year, is proceeding as planned at this time. He said DG is looking forward to the exciting prospect of creating a Malaysian market leader through the proven capabilities of the two established operating companies. AirAsia Malaysia is keeping an eye on demand for international flights as borders reopen globally, especially in the ASEAN region. AirAsia Malaysia Chief Executive Officer Riyad Asmat said the demand would be detected by how countries adapt to the cur uh, current COVID-19 situation as well as the reopening of their borders. With borders being reopened, AirAsia announced that it will again fly to Bengaluru, Kolkata, Kochi, Hyderabad, Chennai and Tiruchirapalli with 71 weekly flights expected by year-end. With the airline hoping to achieve the pre-COVID capacity of more than 140 weekly services to and from India. Uh, we had actually yesterday March 
10 April, it was 200% increase, we gone and it's 13,000 seats sold. So, not bad considering that from literally nothing, zero base, uh, to be honest, uh, versus the period we have surpassed. He said this to the media, announcing the airline's reinstatement of six routes to India at the carrier's headquarters today. Riyadh revealed that the airline is also working on plans to reinstate routes to Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam and Thailand in anticipation of their border reopening. The Kambara Keluarga Malaysia travelogue will be aired on RTM TV1 at the end of May. Communications and Multimedia Minister Tan Sri Anwar Musa explained that the travelogue is a form of support towards the Keluarga Malaysia concept and powered by Prime Minister Dr. Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakob. Dengan adanya siri travelogue ini, rakyat akan dapat melihat uh, bukan saja setting dan juga apa tu keluarga Malaysia dalam bentuk realiti tetapi dapat juga um, diketengahkan inisiatif-inisiatif untuk memperkasakan lagi keluarga Malaysia dan juga kemajuan serta pembangunan di satu-satu kawasan. Dengan cara demikian, uh, keprihatinan terhadap konsep keluarga Malaysia itu akan lebih akan lebih menyerlah lagi. Speaking in Putrajaya, Tan Sri Anwar said that the three main scopes of the travelogue content consists of nature, human lives as well as development. That's it from us this evening in our top story, first dose, PIC kids only until 15 May. Join us for updates at noon at 12.30 tomorrow. Till then, it's lights out. I'm Brenda Paul. Thanks for watching and good night.